Good morning. My name is Pastor Terry. I'm music minister here at First Baptist Church in Cameron, and I'm uh, very pleased that you've joined me for uh, a Bible study teaching today. Uh, this is the second week that I've done a, a teaching, and this is from our Bible Studies for Life curriculum, which we use with some of our Sunday school classes here at First Baptist Church in Cameron. And so if you have this curriculum uh, for the spring of 2020, uh, Bible Studies for Life, you're welcome to use this as a resource as we go through this study together. But you certainly don't need this. Uh, everything that I'm going to share with you this morning, uh, I'll refer to scripture passages. Most of those will also be uh, on the uh, screen that you see uh, behind me. And, uh, and we'll have opportunity for you to pause the teaching and to do some discussion if you're watching this uh, with other people within your family or a small group. And uh, just uh, thank you for, for joining us. I hope it's a blessing to you as, as we uh, dive into God's Word together. So our, our um, lesson this morning is entitled Dealing with Messy Relationships. And we're going to be focusing on the idea of love. One of my favorite movie quotes, which may seem kind of odd, uh, actually comes from the Lego Batman movie. And uh, to kind of set up the quote, what is happening is that the Joker is trying to get Batman to recognize that he, the Joker, is his number one enemy. That he and Batman have a special relationship. To which Batman responds, Whoa, let me tell you something, Jaybird. Batman doesn't do ships, as in relationships. There is no us. Batman and Joker are not a thing. I don't need you. I don't need anyone. You mean nothing to me. No one does. Well, perhaps this time of social distancing, <laughs> uh, we've been reminded of the people who we miss. Unlike Batman, we do need relationships at home, at school, at work, in our community, and at church. However, we also recognize that at times, relationships get messy. When this happens, we must consider, what do we do? Do we get rid of the relationship? Do we, do we blame the other person? Or do we, as Christ followers, allow Him, allow God, to instill within, the, within us the traits that can be used to help clean up that messy relationship. So over these next six weeks, today being the first, we're going to identify and discuss six traits that we should demonstrate as Christ followers to help us in dealing with messy relationships. And so uh, we'll see over these six weeks uh, these traits, the trait of, of being accepting, of yielding, of serving, forgiving, encouraging. And this, this morning, or today, we'll begin with our first trait of love. Let's start with a word of prayer. Our Father, we do thank you for this day. And even though we are separated, uh, possibly uh, within our community, or perhaps even somewhere around the United States, or even around the world with technology today, uh, we recognize that even in our separation, even in our isolation, we can feel comfort through your Spirit, and we can find encouragement in your Word. And so I pray that uh, this morning, or today, as we begin this conversation about dealing with messy relationships and, and the character trait of love, that you would be our teacher, that you would be reminding us and encouraging us and nudging us to, uh, to be loving people even in those difficult relationships in which we can find ourselves. I pray that your spirit would be free to work in, in the heart of every listener, that you truly would be our teacher. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Let me ask you a question. What foods do you like best straight out of the oven? Well, if I were to respond to that question, there are two things that come to my mind. The first is chocolate chip cookies. I mean, you just can't beat them. When they come out of the oven 
and the chocolate chips are melting and they're gooey and they're warm. And, and I'll tell you, last night uh, I received a, a plate of cookies through our children's ministry. Uh, we did an online auction, and so I bid and, and won a plate of cookies from Miss D. And Miss D's cookies are so good that you don't have to even put them in the microwave to make them melt in your mouth. Uh, I, had, I had one, truthfully, I had one last night. And, uh, but, but chocolate chip cookies are just something that, that just tastes great right out of the oven. Uh, a second thought that I have is a cinnamon roll. You know, when the icing is, is still melting and it's running off the roll and, and the kitchen just smells of the aroma of that roll. You know, when something first comes out of the oven, it's fresh. But let that pan of cookies or let that cinnamon roll sit for a few hours or a couple of days or a week and they become hard. They become stale. And perhaps with a little bit of time in the microwave they can regain some of their previous splendor, but they'll never be quite as good as they once were. Well, we recognize that over time relationships can also grow stale. Lack of attention, hurt feelings, difficult situations can all cause relational connections to be lost. However, if you are a Christ follower, you have the power to produce incredible freshness in the lives of others. But the first necessary element to restore that freshness is love. So through today's lesson, may we be challenged to let love permeate every relationship. Let love permeate every relationship. In the Gospel of John, which is where I invite you to turn, we're going to be looking in John chapter 15. So the Gospel of John chapter 15. And what's happened before the verses that we're actually going to begin in today, Jesus has just observed the Passover meal and the Lord's Supper with his disciples. He then begins a long discourse, touching upon many issues, before he and his disciples are dismissed from that upper room and they go to the garden. As part of this discourse, Jesus teaches about fruitfulness. We see this in John 15, verse 1, where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. That thought then leads into this passage, where we're going to be beginning in, in verse 9 of John chapter 15. And it reads like this. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version, so your translation may differ a little bit. But verses uh, 9 and 10. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. So a first step in letting love permeate every relationship is to remain in His love. As we begin this conversation on love, I think it's important that we that we first identify its source. Where, where is this love coming from? And, and maybe that's part of the problem within our culture, is that we believe that, that love is something that we generate on our own. And yet we know that, that when we fall in love with someone, that it's not something that we chose to do. It's, it's, it's something that that happened. It's something that, that overcame us. And so we have to consider, well, what is the source of love? Well, we see this in 1 John. So John's letter, epistle, 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, he says this, God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. So, John is saying God is the author, the root, the source of genuine love. And if that is the case, then this is the truth. The quality of your relationships with others will always be tied to the quality of your relationship with God. 
So if you are dealing with relational messes, then the first thing we need to consider is God being the source of love, what is my relationship to Him? Because the quality of my relationship with anyone else is always going to be tied to the quality of my relationship with God. I, I've used this illustration in, in counseling uh, couples who are engaged to be married, that if, if we think of that the triangle, and, and here we have that, that soon-to-be husband, and here we have the soon-to-be wife, and, and they're at the base of that triangle, and up here at the peak of the triangle is God. And so the, the thought is that as husband and wife grow closer together, they're also growing closer to God. Because if we want our relationships to be strong, then we must recognize the source of those relationships. And, and that is, is God himself. Secondly, we must recognize the sincerity of this love. You notice that in, in John chapter 15, verse 9, he begins with the word, depending on your translation, it's either as or just as. Well, in, in the Greek language, the simple word that we translate as as is better understood according to the manner in which. So Jesus is not only saying that he loves us, just as his father loved. He's, he's, not, he's not just emphasizing the what, the, the love, but he's also emphasizing the how. In the same way, in the same manner that my father has loved me, as my father has loved me, so I am loving you. So this leads us to a third observation. The sequence of love. Again, in verse 9, we see that as the Father has loved me, meaning the Son, I have also loved you, meaning my followers. That's who Jesus was speaking to in John chapter 15. Just as Christ could not love his disciples without first experiencing the love of his heavenly Father, the same is true for you and I. Taken out of sequence, true love will not flow. Love has its source in the Father, and it flows to and through the Son to the believer. Fourth, we see the sequence of love leads to security. Verse 9 ends with the phrase, Abide in my love, or remain in my love. To remain somewhere means to, to dwell there continually. A place where you remain is it's a, it's a place where you feel comfortable enough to make yourself at home. Like other loves we may experience in life, we may treat our love for God as a passing fancy. At one point in time, you might have loved a certain kind of food, but, but over time, you just seem to lose interest in its taste. At one point in time, you may have loved your job, but over time, it became more of an unbearable task. At one point in time, you may have loved a certain hobby, but over time, it just became another thing that you, you felt obligated to do. At one point in time, you may have loved a person, but over time, you found yourself uninterested in their time and in their attention. Without proper care, love will fade. We are instructed, remain, abide in Christ's love. Think of it this way, get comfortable in Christ's love. Stay at home in Christ's love. Abide with Him. Remain with Him. So in this love relationship between us as Christians and, and, and the Son and the Father, we see the source, we see the sincerity, we see the sequence, we see the security and lastly, we see the surrender. Love is sacrifice. The surrender. Without the surrender of our will to the will of God, we cannot remain or abide in His love. So 
does this mean that, that God will stop loving me? No. God's love is, is not conditional. But if we are not fully surrendered to the relationship, then we will begin to feel uncomfortable there. In verse 10, Jesus says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in me. So how did Jesus summarize the commandments? Well, we, we go to this passage in Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 39, where it says, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your soul, and with all your mind, this is the great and foremost commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Do you notice the use of the word all? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. And with all your soul. And with all your mind. God wants us to be all in this love relationship with him to remain or abide in God's love we must obey his command to love him and to love others if you do what Jesus tells you to do then you will feel the full the full force of his love so how would you describe the connection between love and obedience. As, as you consider that question, again, if you're watching this with a spouse or as a family, or maybe you're gathered together with a small group, I'd encourage you now just to, to consider this question, uh, pause your viewing, have a few moments of discussion, and then come back and we'll talk a little bit more about this question before we move on in our teaching today. How would you describe the connection between love and obedience. So when I consider that question, how would, how would I describe the connection between love and obedience? Uh, I guess first I, I want to make sure that you understand that, that God's love is not a conditional love. We, we many times treat love relationships in that way. Well, I, I love you if you do this. I love you when you do this. So as long as you do the things that I want you to do, then I'm going to continue to love you. But, but God isn't that way. God's love is unconditional. God doesn't withhold love because we're not able to, to necessarily live up to his expectation of perfect obedience. So how do we describe then that connection between love and obedience? And in some ways, I, it's, it's like they're, they're inseparable. Uh, to, to, to truly experience God's love and, and to truly want to show God our love, then we will do all that we can to obey Him. But at the same time, when we fail God, when we, when we fall into sin, when we disobey His commands... It doesn't mean that God abandons the relationship that he has with us. His love is still offered to us. I, when I was thinking about this earlier, I thought of the, the, the parable of the prodigal son and, and how the prodigal son, he, he, he distanced himself from his father, from his family. He said, Dad, I, I want what's due to me. I'm out of here. Give me my inheritance and I'm gone. You're nothing to me. I'll see you as I, in my rearview mirror. As, as I leave this place. And, and we know that the way that story unfolds, that the son recognizes his error, he recognizes his sin, and, and he, he decides that he needs to go home. And, and even as he does that, he, he, he's thinking that, well, when I go home, I'll, I'll just offer to be a hired hand. You know, I'll offer to be a slave within my father's house. But the father, he welcomes his son home because the father's love has not changed. The father's love was not dependent upon the son being obedient. So in God's perspective, love, in one way, love and obedience, the, those things are inseparable, and yet they're not conditional. 
So to let love permeate every relationship, we must remain in love. We must remain in His love. As His followers, we must adopt His values and, and, and follow His voice. When we ignore the nudges and promptings of the Holy Spirit within us and, and we chart our own selfish course, we are not being obedient and we're sabotaging our love relationship with Him, which then impacts not only our relationship with Him, but our relationship with others as well. But as we allow love to permeate every relationship, we must remain in His love. But we must also rejoice in loving others. Rejoice in loving others. So we see as we continue in John chapter 15, these words in verses 11 and 12. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be, complete, may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. In verse 11, John is reminding us that the reason that he has spoken of God's love is that we would have joy. In the original language, the word joy is the Greek word kara, and it means gladness, delight. In the original language, kara, the word for joy, is also related to another word. It's, it's called a cognate of the word charis. Kara, charis. And charis is the word for grace. As Christians, our joy is the result of His grace. Were it not for the grace of God, were it not for the redemption, the salvation, the hope, the peace that we have available through the, God's grace, we could not know joy. Our joy is the result of His grace because we have been redeemed. We have been bought back from our slavery to sin and now we can have joy that is, is complete. It fills us. What a wonderful condition for the Christ follower to be so full of the joy of the Lord that there's not room for anything else. So let me ask you this question. And again, you might want to uh, pause uh, this teaching after this question and, and discuss this with whoever you're with. What brings you joy in life? Consider that question and then come back. Well, when I consider possible responses to that question, I, I think maybe several things came up in your discussion if you're answering or discussing these questions with others. You know, one thing that may bring you joy is, is a friendship. Uh, it, it could be a, a, a relationship within your household, a relationship between husband and wife, between a parent and child, uh, between a close friend. So we find that friendships, those relationships with other people, bring us joy. Another thing that might bring you joy in life is, is an interest that you have or a hobby that you have. And, and if you're like me, maybe those things seem to change as, as we uh, go through the stages of life. What you once enjoyed doing as a hobby or as an interest, you may not find much pleasure in anymore. But they can certainly bring us joy. Perhaps it's a job. Uh, for some, we, we find satisfaction. We find joy in working, and especially when we know that our labor is to the Lord, and, and what we labor in, what our job, what our occupation is, we, we truly feel called to, to that position. We, call, we feel called to that job, and that brings joy. Maybe you find joy in, in a possession. Uh, the material things, and, and certainly we don't want to uh, put those things on a pedestal. We don't want to begin to worship those things, those possessions, just as we don't want to worship those uh, relationships. We don't want to worship a job. We don't want to worship an interest or a hobby. Uh, but, uh, but God gave us possessions. He gave us material things, and, and they're for our enjoyment. 
And, and maybe something else that brings you joy is, is just a position that you hold. Uh, maybe it's a, a, a position uh, of, of, of power or authority or, or honor, uh, but it's something that brings you joy. So what we discover is that while these things that we've discussed and recognized, while these things may provide temporary happiness, only a right relationship with God can bring complete joy. Again, only a right relationship with God can bring complete joy. John continues in verse 12 with the command, Love one another as I have loved you. Love one another as I have loved you. The love that we have received must not only flow into us, but it must flow out of us. The gift of Christ's love came with this instruction. Share it. Share it. We are instructed to love the people around us in the same way that Jesus has loved us. So another question to consider. How did Jesus show love? How did he show love to people? If we go to the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we read the stories, we read the, the teachings, we, we read the parables, we, we see the, the, the scenes of, of Jesus' life playing out in those Gospels. How did Jesus show love? So again, Put the teaching on pause. Consider that question and then come back and let's discuss it together. So as I think about the response to that question, maybe your discussions or conversations followed in some of these lines of thought. First, how did Jesus show love? Well, he, he showed love by giving. He gave. Well, what did he give? He, he didn't have... We, I don't think we ever read of a situation in the Gospels where Jesus gave money to someone to make them feel better or gave a thing to someone, a possession, but he gave time. He gave attention. And, and that is certainly a way that we show love. That's how we show love in relationships. That's how you have the opportunity, even right now, is maybe you are staying at home because of the coronavirus, and, and you're locked in with, that, uh, with a spouse or with a child or children or grandchildren, extended family. And, and so what we have is time. We show love by the time that we give, by the attention that we pay. I believe that Jesus also showed love in that he forgave. In fact, if you remember, even at his, at his crucifixion, Jesus spoke these words, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. These men that are nailing me to this cross, this crowd that is mocking me and spitting upon me, forgive them. Jesus forgave. Jesus also pardoned. I think of the lady who was caught in adultery that was thrown at the feet of Jesus and, and he told the, the crowd that had gathered around that, that he who was without sin, let him cast the first stone. And of course the only person that could have thrown that stone was Jesus Christ himself. But instead, he forgave the woman and he told her to go and to sin no more. We see throughout Jesus' life and ministry that he was gracious, that he was kind, that he was merciful, that he, that he was sacrificial, and that he was intentional. So what does it look like for us to love others in the same way that Jesus has loved us? What does that really look like? Well, let me, let me draw a few comparisons for you. If, if we want to love the way that Jesus loved, then we must be selfless rather than selfish. One of the first things I recognized when I got married was that I am a selfish man. And many times, 
the messiness in my relationship with my wife was due to my selfishness. So if we really want to show love, and if we really want to show the love that Christ has and that God has for us, then we must be selfless rather than selfish. Rather, second, we, we must be giving rather than gaining. We must look at, at how we can give in a relationship rather than how we can get or gain from that relationship. Thirdly, we must be peaceable rather than quarrelsome. Sometimes in those relationships, they get messy because we want our own way, and we're willing to argue in order to get it. We're, ready, we're willing to, to give a verbal fight in order to, to have our way in a situation. But if we want to love as Jesus loved, then we must be peaceable rather than quarrelsome. Next, we must be a servant rather than being a master. If you think about that, that right, right before uh, this passage that we're looking at today, uh, in the earlier chapters, Jesus and his disciples, they've arrived at that upper room, and what did Jesus do? He served. Here is the Lord, the Savior, the, the, the Messiah, serving Rather than lording it over his disciples, he chose to serve. So if we truly want to show love the way that Jesus has loved, then we need to be the servant rather than being the master. And lastly, we need to be forgiving rather than holding on to hurts. We recognize that relationships do get messy. And sometimes things are said and things are done. And, and, and while we say we forgive... We also want to hold on to those hurts because we want to be able to use them at some time in the future in case something else comes up. We become historical. And, and yet, if we truly want to love as Christ loves us, then we must be forgiving. So, we are to remain in His love. We are to rejoice in loving others. And the third thing that we see in our lesson this morning or today is that we are to respond with sacrificial love. We are to respond with sacrificial love. And, and again, we turn to our passage in John 15, looking now at verses 13 and 14. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. As we consider Christ's sacrificial love, we see in Him the ultimate standard. No one has greater love than this, that He lay down His life for His friends. What or who are you willing to sacrifice for? We recognize that in relationships, we, we make sacrifices we might think about scenarios such as a, a hard-working man who, who sacrifices, maybe in a bad way, maybe he sacrifices his relationship with his wife or with his children in order to earn a promotion at work or to bring home a bigger paycheck. That's a sacrifice. We might think of a high school student who, who may sacrifice time. They may sacrifice some of, the, some of their leisure time uh, with, with friends in order to be a part of, of an activity or a sport at school. We might see a mom who may make the sacrifice of a career in order to, to stay at home with a young family. So we see examples of the things that we're willing to sacrifice, but, but I believe this is the, the foundational truth. We will sacrifice for what that which is most important to us. We will sacrifice for that which is most important to us. So are you willing to sacrifice for that relationship, the relationship with your spouse, the relationship with your, your child or your grandchild, the relationship with your neighbor, a relationship at work, a relationship at church? Are you willing to make sacrifices? Are you willing to even sacrifice for your faith? What sacrifice are you willing 
to make for Christ? Are you willing to die for him? You know, consider the disciples, how they lived, but also consider how they died. And while some of these things are not certain, uh, there, are, there are traditions, there are beliefs uh, that have been recorded throughout history as to how many of the disciples died for their faith. They truly were willing to lay down their life for what they believed and for Christ. Peter, for example, was crucified on a cross upside down because he did not consider himself worthy to die in the same way as his Lord. Andrew, it is said that he was scourged, that he was tied to a cross rather than being nailed to a cross, where he suffered for two days before his death. James, the brother of John, it is said that he was killed by Herod the king by being beheaded. Nathaniel or Bartholomew uh, is said that he was skinned alive. Philip, perhaps he was hung or crucified. Thomas was stabbed with a spear. Matthew was impaled to the earth by spears and then beheaded. James was stoned to death and then it is said that his body was sawed into pieces. Jude and Simon the Zealot, they were crucified. No one has greater love than this than to lay down his life for his friends. Our family and friends, they may not need us to die for them, but are we willing to do the small things in life to show our love for them and ultimately, God's love. What opportunities do you have to lay down your life for others? Again, I'm going to invite you just to pause the teaching here for just a moment and consider that question. What opportunities, even right now, in the middle of what we're experiencing as a, as a society, as a community, as a country, as a world, what opportunities do I have to lay down my life? to sacrifice for someone else? Consider that question and then come back with me and we'll share a couple thoughts together. So when I think about possible answers to that question, I, again, I think about what's happening right now within our culture. So what opportunities might I have to lay down my life for someone else? Well, one thought that came to my mind was, was possibly helping an, an elderly person with their yard work. Uh, right now, even though it, it might be good for us to, to be outside and, and to be in the fresh air, we also recognize that maybe some of our older neighbors, they just don't have the health or the strength to do the things that springtime requires when it comes to getting into the yard. And, and that's a way that I can sacrifice and show love for someone else. Perhaps if, if you know of someone who's a single mom and, and she just needs... 45 minutes to an hour to make a run to the grocery store without having to take her children with her. That's a way to show sacrificial love. Maybe it's something as simple as preferring, uh, deferring your preference for the preference of someone else. Something as simple as, well, what, what do you want for dinner tonight? Or what would you like to watch on television? What do you want to do tonight? Allowing someone else's preference to take precedent. Maybe it's allowing our kids to decide how the family will spend the evening. You know, all these things are really small sacrifices, and yet they can speak so much to the love that we have for those people. Small acts show great love. Small acts show great love. So from our lesson this morning, the foundational truth let love permeate every relationship. Let love permeate every relationship. And we do that by remaining in His love, by rejoicing in loving others, and by responding with sacrificial love. The story is told of a lady by the name of Maria Dyer. She was born in 1837, and at the time, uh, her parents were missionaries to China. Both her parents died when Maria was just a little girl, and so she was sent back to England, where she was raised by her uncle. 
And even though Maria had lost her parents, that did not deter her heart from the desire to go beyond the mission field and to share the gospel. And so at the age of 16 years old, she, along with her sister, returned to China to work in a girls' school as a missionary. Five years later, Maria Dyer married Hudson Taylor, a man well known today for his life of ministry, faith, and sacrifice, especially on the mission field. Hudson and Maria's work was often criticized, even by other Christians. At one point, Maria wrote these words, As to the harsh judgings of the world, or the more painful misunderstandings of Christian brethren, I generally feel that the best plan is to go on with our work and to leave God to vindicate our cause. Of their nine children between Maria and Hudson, only four survived to adulthood. Maria herself died of cholera when she was only 43 years old, but she believed that the cause was worthy of any sacrifice. On her grave marker, these words were inscribed, For her to live was Christ, and to die was gain. In a day when many are self-absorbed and care more about what they can get rather than what they can give, we need a renewal of sacrificial love. It was God's love for us that sent His own Son, Jesus, into this world to die for our sins. And it is that kind of giving love that our world needs to see today. When we love God as we should, our interests fade and we magnify Him. So let me encourage you. Let love permeate every relationship. May the love that you feel from the Father flow through you into those people whom He has put into your path. Let me finish with a word of prayer, and then I'm going to come back and just share a couple of announcements. Father, we do thank you for the love that you have demonstrated to us through your Son. We thank you for the resurrection. We thank you for the victory that is ours through the death and the life, the resurrected life of your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for loving us, even when we are unlovable, even when we are disobedient, even when we are rebellious. Thank you for forgiving, and thank you for continuing to love. May your love flow through us to every person whom you place in our life beginning within our own household, to our spouse and to our children, to our family, into the relationships that you give us at school and at work and in our neighborhood, in our community and in our church. Lord, may love permeate every relationship and may you be glorified by the way that we live and by the way that we love. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. So again, uh, this morning's, today's lesson, was uh, the first of six in this unit, dealing with messy relationships. And, uh, and so this uh, lesson focused on the trait of love. And again, I invite you to come back next week uh, and uh, continue with this teaching. Uh, of course, at this time, there's still much uncertainty as, as far as how long we will continue to uh, not be able to meet together as a church family. But I do believe that even when those restrictions begin to get lifted and we do begin to restore some uh, ministries and some opportunities to gather in the walls of First Baptist Church here in Cameron, uh, that teachings like this are probably going to continue to be available uh, because we recognize that some of those that, that may want to be here when we begin to restore activities at church are also those that are most vulnerable and most in danger of getting sick. And so we want to continue to provide opportunities for them to worship and also opportunities for them to participate in discipleship uh, through video teaching such as this. So continue to, to check out our website or our Facebook, however you are able to best connect with us. And then one other announcement, something that uh, has been on my heart for some time, usually on Mother's Day, the men's ministry of First Baptist Church tries to provide a breakfast for moms. 
And uh, that was our plan this year, was to have a nice breakfast in our gymnasium and to start our uh, worship uh, activities that day on Sunday, May 10th, with a breakfast before we had our small group Sunday school and before we went to worship. Well, obviously right now it looks like we won't be having those activities here. But we are going to have a breakfast. And the way this will be set up is uh, I will recruit a few men to help me in the kitchen and we will fix breakfast that morning and it will be available for you to pick up, to take home and to enjoy with your mom, with your spouse, with your children, with your family. And so what we would ask you to do is in order for you to receive that breakfast from our kitchen, we need to know that you're coming, how many you need to feed, and what time you would like to pick that up. I would expect that on that Sunday, May 10th, we will have breakfast ready to pick up at 7.30 a.m., between 7.30 and 9.30. So for that two-hour time span, you are able, uh, sometime this week or up until the middle of the following week, uh, so that Wednesday before Mother's Day, we want to be able to kind of cut off our reservations so we can do our shopping and get uh, items ready to prepare. But you can call the church office at 816-632-7251 and you can leave a message with the secretary as to who you are and how many you need breakfast for and what time you would like that picked up. So you might say, well, my name is Joe Jones and I need family for uh, we have a family of five, and we would like to be able to pick that breakfast up at 8.30 on that Sunday morning. We will have it boxed up and ready for you to pick up at that time that you designate. And so if you have any questions, give us a call at the church. We'll put information about that on our website and also through our Facebook page, where you can also email us. You can also send us a message through Facebook to make those reservations. So again, that's on Mother's Day, Sunday, May 10th, a breakfast which is available for families. Uh, also, we will try to have uh, delivery available for those who absolutely cannot get out to pick up a meal. Uh, so we will try to make some delivery service available on a limited basis as well. And if you would like to donate for that cause, you're welcome to do that. Suggest a donation of $3, but not for mom. Mom's meal is free. We don't want anything for that meal. But others that are receiving those meals, if you would like to donate, you're welcome to do that, but you don't have to. So just a way for us to show our love and our appreciation to our mothers on Mother's Day. So again, I hope that you will have a great day and a great week. Thank you for joining us uh, for this morning, for today's teaching.